good morning. Welcome to Central Assembly. Let's stand to our feet as we worship his name today. Give him praise and glory. Let's put our hands together as we rejoice this morning. Come on, sing it with me. God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. Come on, lift it. Cause he opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. Oh my God, he holds the victory. Lift your voice today. Yeah. Oh, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet.
express that to him today. God, thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness. You've been so good to me. How could I not say thank you, Jesus? How could I not be grateful for all you've done? You make a way. You make a way. You've been faithful. In faith. Come on, even when we think of tough times, difficult times, we can still say, God, you're good. God, you're faithful. You will bring me through. 
even in times of trouble, when my circumstance, when my situation doesn't seem bright. God, just as David and the psalm writers have said, God, I still, I trust in your faithfulness. I trust in your faithfulness. We'll just take a moment to, to breathe that in. God, I trust in your faithfulness. My confidence is in your faithfulness. My hope is in your faithfulness. My trust, God, it's in your faithfulness today. Jesus. First Chronicles 16 says, sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. And this is where I want to key in, verse 25. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He deserves our praise. He is most worthy of that today. And we're going to continue singing of the faithfulness of God, telling of his good deeds, of who he is to us as we sing this hymn of the church. Great is thy faithfulness. All we have needed, your hand has provided. We're thankful, we're grateful for that, God. Come on, could you sing that with us this morning? Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassions, they fail. And together we sing this, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath Church lifted great is
Let's lift our voice together. Great is, oh, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand that Come on, tell them great is oh, oh, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, Thank you, Lord. Great is your faith. All we have needed, you provide. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Come on, sing that great is. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We stand in awe of you today. We lean into your faithfulness as you fill this house with your spirit and presence. We honor you as the sovereign Lord over every circumstance in our lives. We honor you as the one who has loved us before we loved you. And we worship you today. And we declare in the face of every question, every disappointment, every challenge we're facing, we declare with faith, your faithfulness is great. And it's new every morning. And this new morning, we say, Lord, you're the faithful God who walks with us. And so, Lord, we stand in gratefulness today and we welcome your presence thank you Lord great are you Lord no one is like you in heaven or earth majestic in holiness doing wonders who is like the Lord our God we worship you today holy mighty one Lord thank you thank you Lord we pray today as as we're gathered as a church for, Lord, the families of those who lost loved ones and friends in the shooting in the mall in Dallas yesterday afternoon, as well as other families where, where mass shootings have just become rampant the first last few months. Give our leaders wisdom as they deal with mental health issues and gun safety issues and, and all of those things. Lord, give our leaders wisdom where there seems to be no solutions but we pray, we as the people of God pray for a spiritual awakening that will break violence in the land and a spiritual awakening that will break addiction in the land and hatred in the land. And my God, we pray you'll send a spiritual awakening, oh God, that will cause people's hearts to be healed and mended and turned to you and that you will visit, visit churches throughout our city, visit churches throughout our nation today as we pray. And we ask, oh God, that you will do what we cannot do. And we thank you for this. And we praise you. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are able. King of kings, Lord of lords, nobody like you. We praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Just a point of prayer. I'd like to, two points of prayer. 
more, I'd just like to take you to, first of all, one just before you're seated. And Tori here on our worship team, uh, we love and appreciate this wonderful lady. She's graduated from Evangel. Congratulations. She's been our music intern. She's been working with us, volunteering for three years. Really helped us with our youth worship teams as well as adults here. You see her often. We interact with her a lot during the week as a staff, and we love and appreciate you. This is our last Sunday. She's moving back to Massachusetts. She's going to be doing graduate studies online from there. I know she'll be a blessing to her home church. And are your parents here? Yeah. Whew. Good job on this girl. Wonderful job. Good job on her. May the hand of the Lord be upon Tori, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Thank you for the gift she's been to our church family, how you've used her. Now, Lord, let, let, let the days ahead just prosper with the grace of God in her. Let her walk close to your heart and bless her in her coming in and her going out, we pray. We bless her in the name of the Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you, Lord. You, we're going to come to one more point of prayer. You may be seated, and we'll have you stand when we do the prayer in a few moments. But we're, we're honored to have another baby dedication. Delighted. We love the babies that are part of Central. And uh, this one's real, real special. I'd like the Lowenberg and the Lolly clan, if they would come up. And Devin and Ruthie uh, Lolly are bringing their new little daughter, Emmeline, to dedicate her to the Lord. Now, you remember the Lollies. Uh, they've been a part of this church for many years. And uh, we're also part of our Global Footprint celebration, our missions, because they're some of the God missionaries in Camaros. And uh, Ruthie's dad is my wife's only brother, my brother-in-law. We've been friends. He introduced me to Sandy way back. I'm eternally indebted. And brought her to church one day. You should bring people to church. And uh, he brought her to church one day and introduced her. Doug is missionary with Crean in Ethiopia with the sons of God, and they just arrived two days ago from Addis in Ethiopia. Julia is their other daughter, and she and Tracy got married about a year and a half ago, and they're both uh, appointed missionaries with the sons of God. And the Lolly clan, we love them. So good to have you here with us as well. And uh, we are, we're, we're going to do a baby, Pastor Doug's going to do a baby dedication so um, when it comes to the prayer time, let's all stand. But otherwise, you can remain seated for a few moments. Beautiful little girl. This is Emmeline Grace Lally. She's five months old, born the 6th of December. You want to talk to them a little bit? She probably will in a few minutes. This is our first time to meet her. Well, we got back into the country a couple of days ago, so we're pretty excited, Corrine and I, to be able to have this little sweet girl. You know, all, in our tradition, we, we consider this a dedication of the baby to the Lord and the family, the parents, the extended family, which is all of you, to the Lord in helping raise our children. We don't consider this a salvific moment, but we believe it. Are you going to be a preacher? <laughs> but we believe that this is very important and very real in setting our children apart for the Lord, that when they come to that day that they understand, they will make a commitment. I want to follow Jesus. And I pray that this little... <laughs> A third culture kid, this little missionary kid, will someday, maybe like her mom and her sister, maybe be baptized in water in the Indian Ocean. You know, it's a special, special holy water out there if the sharks don't eat you. So I'm going to read a couple of verses that I really feel the Lord has led me in dedicating this little child. But as I do this, I want you to think of your children, your grandchildren, and recommit yourselves to raising our families in love, in fear, in safety, in security, but leading them to love and know Jesus, that it's someday he will be their Lord and Savior. So I'll give you back to 
as I, and we've been very excited for this moment, we've talked about it for months, but as I, I thought and I prayed, I just want to read a couple of different verses that I feel these are for Emmeline, but they're for our kids. And I was reminded of the fact back in Genesis 1, it says, God created man or humankind in his own image. In his own image, he created them, male and female, he created them in his image. And when I was thinking of you, Emmeline, you are made in the image of God. Yes. A capacity to know God, a capacity to make him known, a capacity to represent God. Yes, <laughs> wherever he will lead you. And then I was reminded of, there's so many, but just three powerful, godly women in the Bible. And I, I pray that somehow prophetically the Spirit of the Lord might, in his way, make this real in your life, Emmeline. In Judges chapter 4, we read about Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth. I don't know where she's going to find her Lapidoth. Um, but anyway, that was the name of Deborah's husband but a prophetess leading Israel in a very difficult, oppressed time. And as a powerful woman, a leader, a prophetess, a worship singer, she led Israel to deliverance. I pray the spirit of Deborah on you, sweet little girl, that you will be a prophetess and powerful I was reminded of another very, very interesting, super godly woman named Hulda. And in 2 Chronicles, what surprises me about that, you know, that's the time Josiah, they discovered the law that had been buried and, and just overlooked for centuries, it seems. And he discovered the law and he realized how evil the nation had been. And they went to look for a prophet to guide them in what to do. Do you know this is the same time that Jeremiah was at work? But the Lord led them to a woman, a prophetess, a mother, who had a word from the Lord for the king and the nation. Emmeline, I pray the spirit of Huldah a powerful prophetess with the word for a nation and a people. But I don't want to leave out the New Testament. And I was reminded again of a, a powerful lady, a married couple in Acts chapter 18, and it's the reference to Aquila and Priscilla, a married couple. They were political refugees. They were displaced people, but they were very open to being used of the Lord. And what I, what I love about her is later on in Acts chapter 18, when they came in contact with the, the great prophet from North Africa, Apollos, who had not yet encountered the power of the Holy Spirit, it says they met together and it's probably Priscilla who was doing the main teaching. She explained to him the way of the Lord more adequately. A woman who knew the power of the Spirit. A woman who was hospitable and invited people into her home. And I know you're only five months old, little girl, but I pray that God Almighty will use you and anoint you and use you in the days that he sets before you. And one day you're going to invite Jesus into your life and he will use you and I pray that on behalf of all the children represented here today. Can I hold her and can we all come together? Just come surround us and we're gonna, and would you all stand? And as we pray for Emmeline and we dedicate her, we dedicate her mom and dad to raising this child and her sweet big brother, Nolan, whom we love that God will help us be families in a crazy world where we love, we model grace, spirit, safety, parenting, discipline, 
that these kids will grow up and be another Deborah, another Huldah, another Priscilla, made in the image of God. Lord, thank you for this sweet little girl that you have given to Ruthie and Devin. I pray that you will help them as they raise her, as they raise her out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and that you will provide every need. You will provide safety. You will provide spiritually, physically, that you will help her as she grows as a little sister and a wonderful big brother. And God, that you will provide every need. We commit her to you that someday she'll make that commitment in her own heart to follow you, filled with the Spirit, walking in your way. And Lord, for all of us who are the extended families, may we stand with our families, stand with our children, be encouraging and loving and gracious to raise up a new generation of men and women who love and serve you. We pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You want to say amen? Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Doug. That was great. And uh, it's fun to kind of have family together, which uh, we're so scattered around the world, it doesn't happen a lot. So thank you for being a part of this moment with us. Name tag Sunday. So maybe somebody has a name tag, turn around, say hi, look at their name, welcome them, and uh, then you may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to Central. If you're new or visiting with us today, please be sure to fill out the Connect card in front of you and drop it in one of the offering boxes at the back of the room. Or come visit one of our staff at the Central Hub in the foyer. They would love to meet you and answer any questions you have about Central. Now, we also have a Central meet and greet every Sunday at 9 a.m. in room 123. So come and say hello and get connected. Now, if you're online today, click the Connect With Us option at the top of your screen to get in touch with a member of our pastoral team. And if you haven't already, say hello in the chat window and let us know where you're watching from today. We're so thankful for all of you who may not be able to attend in person, but are with us week to week online. Now, before we get to some other announcements, next week is Mother's Day, and we're really excited to take time as a congregation to honor the women in our church family. Here's Pastor Jim with a look at what's ahead and what's on his heart for next weekend. Thank you, Pastor Anthony. I'm really excited about Mother's Day coming up. Often we have guests in or I have moms in the church do the preaching, but I just felt like I just want myself to be able to have a time with all you ladies and the guys listening in in our combined service on Mother's Day morning. I'm just going to talk from my heart. just want to encourage you, minister to you. It'll be kind of a casual version of a sermon. Uh, but there's just, I, I just felt this year, I, I just want to, as your pastor, just to talk to you. And we're going to be having refreshments at 9 in the lobby, coffee, and, and, you know, come bring mom, make it a wonderful time. We can semi take care of breakfast for you. And then at 10 o'clock, one big combined serve, both services all together. That's always fun. And we're just going to celebrate the ladies in our church, whether you're a mom or not. We're going to make a fuss over saying to you, you're really important to us. And we thank God for you. So I encourage you to come join us. 
Well, thanks, Pastor Jim. It's going to be a great weekend at Central. However, we're still not done with this weekend. Tonight, we look forward to gathering for another special edition of our monthly night of worship and prayer. The Central Worship Choir will be with us and will be leading in the music of Charity Gale. Recently, Charity has impacted church worship through deeply personal, Christ-focused songs like I Speak Jesus, Thank You Jesus for the Blood, New Name Written Down in Glory, and many more. Tonight, we'll be joining together as a congregation to sing through a number of songs from her Endless Praise album. We'll also welcome the incredible voice of our guest, Jill Bryant, as she joins with Pastor Josh Schaefer in Central Worship to invite God's presence into this time of worship and corporate prayer. Prayer is foundational at Central. And in addition to nights like these, we also have opportunities for you to join with others to seek God's will and presence in the life of our church and those around us. Visit centralassembly.org slash prayer today to learn more about ways you can engage in a rich prayer life through opportunities like our Tuesday noon prayer for the services and outreaches of Central Assembly, our Wednesday evening pre-service prayer to cover our church family activities, leadership, and congregational needs, or our Thursday noon prayer in the chapel as an open time to bring your needs, as well as requests from others before the Father. Again, we encourage you to visit centralassembly.org slash prayer and explore these options or just find the best way for you to make time in your schedule to slow down and pray. Every week, we take time to focus on how your giving to Central's Footprint Fund supports ministries around the world. And today, we're happy to have the subject of our Footprint Focus with us right here in person. Here's Pastor Jim with more. I've asked my brother-in-law, Doug, just to come. We support like 220 missionaries every month, and uh, three of them were on this platform, three of the missionary families, and uh, all related, including Doug and his two daughters and their families. So I thought just before we get to the word in a few moments, Doug, if you just bring us a word of greeting. Yeah. I just wanted to say thank you, Central. And you don't know, uh, I know you just can't even understand what it's like to walk in here when you've been living in the majority world and to sense the wonderful presence of the Lord and the quality of worship and just everything is just so spectacular. Uh, it's, it's just thrilling to be here. Thank you, Pastor Uncle Jim. Uh, and on behalf of our family, we, we all say thank you because you support all of us. Karina and I are serving in, based in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia working with our national church, our Bible schools. We have some extended ministries across the continent. But you invest and you pray, and we are very, very honored to be part of your global footprint that is very massive. Julia is, uh, is our oldest daughter, and the Lord called her independently of us to serve in Africa, and Tracy has come into her life, and they both are committed career missionaries. She works with, through Africa's hope, developing materials we're using all across the continent of Africa and helps oversee translation in 18 or 20 different languages. I know we have translated three of those into different languages in Ethiopia that we use to train people. In Ethiopia, 20 different extensions, about 500 students are benefiting from the work of Julia, so it's kind of fun to have that inner family connection. And then the Lali clan are serving out in islands off of Madagascar, uh, where it's basically 100% Muslim, reaching out to people who have never, ever, ever heard of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that he died and he rose on their behalf, raising two very special little grandkids, their kids, out there. So we just want to say on behalf of all of us, thank you. And on behalf of all those 200 plus, thank you for your regular giving, your prayers. You don't know what a difference they make, but we say thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Thank you, Doug. Well, great having you guys here. I'm going to come to God's Word. We'll be looking at Mark 5. We started a series of Mark just two weeks ago. Mark 1, Mark 3, today Mark 5. I can't guarantee it'll be 7 next week. In fact, it won't be. But anyway, so far we're skipping every other. Uh, but this series will take us through probably to early August. And I've entitled it Just Jesus. And we're going to come to a truly Just Jesus moment today as we talk about power for the powerless, power for the powerless. You know, it's not fun 
to feel powerless. Um, usually, I'm used to always having options. Even when the airlines mess me up when I'm traveling, it's still nice to know I have status, I have phone numbers I can call. I mean, it's always nice to know you have some options. But there are moments in our lives when we're just truly powerless. I mean, Sandy and I were driving home last year on a Saturday evening from a wedding, and my car lost power. I mean, it just died. Turned out the alternator went out. I had no battery left. And there's just a little emergency for our flashers, a little emergency power. But I pulled over just enough to get sort of on a narrow shoulder, barely on the shoulder. And it was where the road was curved. People were flying by us. It was kind of a dangerous place. And so I thought, well, I have roadside assistance. I pay every month for roadside assistance. And of course, it's the middle of Saturday night in Springfield. They only had one tow truck driver, and he wouldn't show up for almost two hours. And it started getting dark, and our flasher started fading because the battery was virtually dead. And it was not like I could call one of you, like, would you come park right behind us so that they could hit your car instead of our car? And that wasn't going to work. I mean, nobody could help us. I called 911. It's the middle Saturday evening in Spring, a city as small as Springfield, and they couldn't do anything for me. So, so we ended up getting home late that night and safe, thank God. But it was just, I, it's been years since I felt that powerless, like we were truly out of options. We were afraid, and we're just sitting there praying cars wouldn't hit us. And that moment is a moment some of us live with, I mean, all the time. Some of your lives are somewhere between not that fun to desperate and miserable, and you've been living in that space for some time. Some of you who even know Jesus and believe every word we sang this morning. Because there are moments of just abject powerlessness that can come into our lives. And so we're going to look at a, sto a story of a lady who was a case study in powerlessness. The story starts in verse 24 of Mark 5. So Jesus went with him. Uh, him, I thought we were talking about her. Him is Jairus, a synagogue leader who has a 12-year-old daughter who's dying. The story of this powerless lady will be sandwiched in between this story of Jesus ministering to Jairus and his daughter. That will be the beginning and the end. But this, this, hap this story will be sandwiched in the middle. Jairus, interestingly enough, had a 12-year-old daughter. And on the way, he will heal this lady who's out of options, who's been sick for 12 years. 12 is often a number of uh, uh, representing the people of God, like the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament, the 12 apostles in the New Testament. Some scholars believe that this is God's sort of double-barrel way of saying, I really have you in my sight. I really care for you, and I can really help you. So you'll see the repetitive nature of the number 12 throughout this. As, as we become the target of God's goodness. But after saying, so Jesus was going with him to Jairus, to Jairus' house, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And I, I don't know if you've been crowds where they're just pressing there. I mean, you can barely breathe. You feel like a, you know, you're stuffed together with people like sardines. And, and a large crowd followed him and press, pressed around him. And a woman was there, a woman was there who had been, subject to bleeding for 12 years. So he's on the way to visit a 12-year-old who's sick, and this woman who's had bleeding for 12 years uh, is there. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And if we were to reverse engineer that verse we would see that she is indeed a walking picture of powerlessness. She's out of options. She's powerless. Bleeding for 12 years, she's probably not got much more left to her life. First of all, she was socially powerless. Unfortunately, Jesus tried to change some of this, but, but if you're a female, you were first of all second class in that culture. And this is likely kind of a menstrual-related bleeding that just never stopped, which meant she probably was never able to marry. And, uh, and she would have had that also, the sec another social stigma of, of not being married, which means she had very few employment op opportunities. I mean, she was on her own. She was socially powerless. 
and there was no social safety net to rescue her at that time. And she was also, I would say, religiously powerless because according to the Old Testament law of Moses, that, that constant bleeding that just never stopped rendered you as a person ritually unclean. So being ritually unclean means that if you, if you touch somebody else, you'd transmit that uncleanness to them. So nobody wants you around, right? Because if you're unclean, you've got to sort of quarantine for a while and do the rituals until you are ritually pure again. She was ritually unclean because of her bleeding, and anybody she touched would become unclean. It's interesting in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament law, with ritual clean, purity and, and uncleanness, if you touch somebody you can, that, that's, that's clean, you can transmit uncleanness to them. However, if someone's clean touches you, you don't get their cleanness. It's kind of like you can catch a person's cold, but not their health. It, it just reminds me how insidious in this present age right now that sin and evil is. It's so infectious. And you need a personal connection with God, not, not through somebody else to be truly forgiven and clean. And so she's, she's socially isolated, religiously isolated and powerless. She's professionally powerless. Mark says very specifically she'd been to many doctors. She'd been to every specialist in town, and she kept getting worse. Nobody had the cure. And as a result, she was financially powerless. All those medical bills started stacking up until finally she was bankrupt. She was broke, and she had no money left. I mean, even if she did find another doctor, there'd be nothing to pay. She was powerless. And, and I think, you know, you, with that kind of blood loss year after year, she's just physically depleted and powerless. I mean, I'm sure she just had to push herself. And then this crowd's around Jesus, and, and, but she's there. And, and it's probably taken every ounce of energy in her because she would be so physically depleted. And I would imagine that means she was emotionally depleted and powerless as well. I mean, she had been to so many doctors. And you know, every time you go to a doctor, you know, your hope, every time you come forward and someone pray for you, your hope gives up. And then if you don't get better, then, it, then poof, disappointment. So, so you try another doctor. Maybe this is it. You get up, and then it just lets you down afterwards. And, and you, you, you ride that emotional roller coaster long, long enough. I mean, I've had people say, even people of God say, I don't even want to hope anymore. Because I'm so afraid of being let down. This was her story over and over and over again. She was a walking picture of powerlessness. Now, I always want to be kind of church where we can ask the hard questions and be safe. And, and, you know, here's the hard question. If there's a loving God in heaven, how come he lets a woman suffer like that for 12 years? Well, she's going to meet Jesus. Yeah, but it would have been nice if she met Jesus after one month, not 12 years. I mean, why? And we understand that right now we live in this present age. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. And yet Jesus' first sermon in Mark was the rule of God, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's breaking in on the powers of this present age where there's so much evil, darkness. There's so many people who use power abusively. There are so many victims. There are so many hurt. There's, there are dead people in Dallas from the shootings yesterday. I mean, we live in this age. He's going to bring it to an end. Thank God he's going to put the death sentence on this eventually, on all this evil and victimization and suffering. Jesus said the kingdom of God has begun to break in on this age. Thank God we live in this age, but we belong to the age to come. This changes our perspective. And we never lose touch with, in spite of what may circumstantially be happening around us, there is something that doesn't change about the nature of God. He is ceaselessly and relentlessly good. And so like in Psalm chapter 10, verse 14, but you, God, see trouble. You, you, you do see trouble. Now, he spent all the previous verses just kind of going off on how the wicked are just getting their way and they're victimizing all these people. Oh, God, it's terrible. And it's like the psalmist doesn't question the existence of God, but he comes to the character of God. And we don't know, you know, why these two ages overlap and why, why darkness is continuing on. All we know is Satan's on a short leash right now because of what Jesus did at the cross. And, and he's going to be defeated in the end. But, but 
right in the same breath after, after just bemoaning all the victimizers that are out there. He said, but you, Lord, do see the trouble of the afflicted and you consider their grief and you take it into hands and the victims commit themselves to you and you are the helper of the fatherless. So you might have come in here today and I'm still struggling with this thing. I've tried everything I can. I've been prayed for 50 times and nothing's changed yet. But you're going to still stand here and declare that the goodness of God is still chasing after you. And that he is faithful. Because we don't think circumstantially or emotionally about our lives. We think theologically. And we understand we belong to the age to come, not this age. The age to come is what defines us. And we belong to a God who, in spite of what I might see or feel around us in the, me in the short term, he is relentlessly good. In fact, I love that second song we sang, his goodness is chasing after us. Sometimes I say, Lord, uh, could you speed up? <laughs> I'm, I'm getting like way ahead of you. Could you just speed up your goodness a little bit? But we come and by faith declare that because we know this about our God. Deuteronomy 10, 18. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. These are the most vulnerable in society. These are the ones most abused by power that's wrongly used. The fatherless, the widow, they're the most disadvantaged. You love the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing, even the foreigner. And he says, you're going to love them as well so that, because you, you were foreigners in Egypt. You, you had a brutal life. You were slaved by people who used power over you abusively. But, but God eventually came through for you. And then Jesus, he stands. He goes home. He started his public ministry. He decides to go home to Nazareth where he grew up. And he goes to Sabbath. Uh, on Sabbath, he goes to the synagogue. And hey, our boy's back. Let's let him read the scripture this morning in service. So the hand Jesus scroll, he opens it up to Isaiah chapter 63. Everybody knew Isaiah 63 was talking about the Messiah to finally come and give us deliverance and relief. And so he opens to 63. Chapter 63 of Isaiah begins reading. And Luke, in Luke 4, quotes exactly what he read out of Isaiah 63 in the Old Testament hundreds of years earlier. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim news to the rich and privileged. Mm -mm. That's not our God. Our God never loses track of the victim or the weak. But he's proclaimed, he's anointed me. That's the giving of the Spirit of God upon him to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners and addicts and everybody who's trapped. He sent me to proclaim freedom for, freedom for prisoners, the recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I don't see enough. The next line in Isaiah says, and the day of judgment. But Jesus stopped short of that because he knew with his coming this was the day of the Lord's favor. He's for the oppressed. He's for the powerless. He, he's near to the one and feels the grief of the hurting. So, so here it is. That's where he ends it. It's come to bring favor. He winds the scroll back up, hands it back. Everybody's got their eyes on him. And then he sends shockwaves through his town. It almost gets him killed a few minutes later. Because everybody knew Isaiah 63 spoke of the Messiah. And then Jesus just confidently pronounced. This day, that scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. He was saying, I'm the Messiah. They didn't like that. They thought he was the carpenter who grew up. But Jesus was saying, I'm the champion of the powerless. So what do we do with this? We have a woman who suffered for 12 years, not knowing why God allowed that but just a reality of our present age. And then you've got a, good, a God who is invariably and relentlessly good. And how do you live in that kind of tension between them? Where, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? And this is why I find this particular story so very, very helpful. Because first of all, she did what we need to do. She, she kept pressing on toward healing. 
She kept pressing on toward healing. But I've been prayed for before, nothing happened. No, she just kept pressing on towards healing. Because she said when she heard this about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, she came up. Remember, she's in a weakened condition. Crowds are just pressing against Jesus. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She probably would have had to be on her hands and knees, uh, kind of trying to weave her way between people's ankles because people's bodies were so pressed against each other. And she just reaches out, and, and maybe Jesus' cloak was just dragging in the dirt. She just reached out, say, even one finger. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, if I can just touch it, she said, I will be healed if I can just touch it. So this lady, she, 12 years of suffering hadn't deconstructed her faith. 12 years of suffering hadn't made her just despair as powerless and out of options as she was in life. She just said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I can be healed. Uh, let, let, let me encourage you in that. I, I just think it's God's general will that he provide for you, that his general will is that, is that you can recover if you need healing. That's his general will. That's why if I once in a while have a headache and I pop a Tylenol, I'm not feeling like I'm going against God's will, like God doesn't want, m want me to feel better. If I fall at home and break my arm, you know, I'm probably not going against God's general will to call 911 and have my arm reset. Well, can't God do that supernaturally? Absolutely, he does. And I hope and pray he does more and more of that. I heard a story of somebody recently that broke their arm very badly, and a family member, Kay, laid, laid their hand on it, and they just watched that, that arm reassemble. He can do that. It was his will to heal. But if he doesn't do it supernaturally, it's probably still his will that I get it taken care of. Because his general will is for us to keep pressing towards recovery, keep pressing towards healing. I told you the story sometime that I kind of up the years this morning. It was 18 years ago. I was pacing the floor in the middle of the night. I was trying to pray. I think I was more worrying. And I felt like the Spirit of God said, Bradford, just stop. Just look down at your feet. Draw an imaginary square around it. And don't step out of that square. I want you to stand the ground of faith. And I want you to consider no other possibility other than I am going to provide for you. You know what? It actually happened last year, 18 years later. I don't know why it took 18 years but God kept his word. Because why? Our, unless there's something else sovereign he has in mind, unless there's something else going on in my life that, that needs to be taken care of first. I mean, God's general will is provision. God's general will is healing. God's general will is help you move forward. And this is what she assumed. She said, if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And, and I just want to encourage you to keep pressing towards it. But what if God doesn't? What if I've been up here 50 times for prayer as we will have prayer workers and just at the end of our service, you let any one of you want to have prayer. What if it's done it 50 times? Well, we kind of covered this two weeks ago again, but it's so important. You know what? You, I, I, I Come 51 times. I'm, I'm going to keep, I, I'm not going to kind of cave in and unbelief and say, God, I don't think you'll do anything for me. I, unless he lets me know differently, his general will is for me to keep believing him. If I just touch him, I will recover. So we keep pressing forward towards healing. And if it doesn't happen, it was like those three Hebrew young men uh, we talked about a few weeks ago. When, when King Nebuchadnezzar, he was evil and he used power abusively and they wouldn't, warn, they wouldn't bow down, these three Hebrew guys, to, to renounce the true and living God and worship this king's idol. So, so he, he threatened to throw him in a furnace. Not a very nice way to die, being burned alive. But they said to him, O king, our God can deliver us. And then, interesting, they say, our God will deliver us. Knowing our God is good to those that are victimized and oppressed, the plan is that God's going to deliver us. He, he can and he will. But if he doesn't, I still believe he's good and I'm still going to follow him. And you kind of need that third point to avoid just getting angry with God, frustrated. God, why didn't you do this? I thought you told me to keep having faith. And then when nothing happens, you know what? So you go in armed at all three levels, convinced he can, convinced he will because he's a good God. But if he doesn't, 
it doesn't change it. I'm still his and he's still good. So that, that's helped me a lot just to keep pressing towards healing. And in that, like this lady, we just, we just constantly believe that Jesus' power really can flow into our powerlessness. I mean, we know theologically he's good, but personally, that his power really can flow into my powerlessness. So verse 29, she reaches out, she touches him. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. I mean, this is powerful. But the next verse, let's camp on that one for a moment. This is the verse that amazes me. I mean, thank God, 12 years, what mercy God had on her. But at once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. Now, everybody's pressing against him, but she touched him in a different way, with a kind of faith that could just draw God's power into her life. But Jesus realized something, something happened, and it said power had gone out from him. You see, God can pour his power into the places of our powerlessness. And then we get to the New Testament, good old Apostle Paul, right? And he said, well, I had a new lesson in this. He tells us all about this in 1 Corinthians 12. And he said, I have this thorn in the flesh. And he doesn't tell us what it was, but it was aggravating and probably painful. And he said, I had so many incredible spiritual experiences that the Lord said to me, just to keep your feet on the ground, just to keep you from pride, I'm I'm going to give you the sword in the flesh. So, Jesus, so Paul says, I prayed three times. And every time God said, I'm not going to do it. Well, I thought he was a good God. Well, he may have purposes here that are bigger than us. But all of a sudden, God, Paul takes our spirituality from one dimensionality. Here's one dimensional spirituality. Um, as long as God gives me a good day today, he's a good God but like one lady actually said to me to my face, if God doesn't bless me, I have no interest in him. That's very one-dimensional. God's good as long as I have a good day. But Paul takes us much deeper. And he said, he gave me this sore in the flesh and said, I'm not going to take it away from you. Instead, in fact, I put it on the screen, verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect when you're feeling good. And it's easy to have faith. It's easy to have faith when you're feeling good. And I have lots of faith when everything's going well. And when it's not, and I'm going, God, where are you? And when I'm feeling weak, and I'm feeling that disconnect between 12 years of bleeding, but I know technically God's good. I mean, where do you go with that? And Paul says, here's where I go with that. Jesus told me my power is made perfect in weakness. Get this. I do my best work, God said to Paul, when you can't bring much to the table and you're weak. And so Paul says, I will therefore boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power might rest on me. Now, we'd probably want to lock somebody up who just goes around talking about their weaknesses. Think, boy, you have low self-esteem. But Paul had learned what we call a crucified life, dying to what we bring to the table, and it's not like, well, I'm going to be angry at God if he doesn't bless me today. But Jesus said, no, there's grace in me that's sufficient because you're going to find in a new way your powerlessness, not your feeling good today, but your powerlessness actually attracts my power. And your powerlessness puts you in the vicinity of the flowing in of my power and of my spirit. It's very profound. In weakness, we're strong. I preached for 50 years almost now. I preached at an event for some national leaders last Wednesday here in town, and I was still nervous before I got up. And I'm glad for that nervousness because I, I never want to lose touch with how little I bring to the table and how powerless I am in myself. Because after walking deeply with the Lord for a while, you're going to learn that he does his best work when you're weak. Not that he's going to torture you all the time just so he can show off his greatness. But he's your partner. He walks with you. His spirit lives in you. 
And in your weakness, his power is made perfect. Perfect. So this isn't trite Christianity. This isn't one-dimensional spirituality. This is walking in the spirit and power of God. All our hurts, all our insufficiencies, I mean, there is place there for Jesus' power to flow into your powerlessness. But I'm almost done. But just one more thing happens. I mean, this lady kept, like we should, kept pressing towards healing. And, and she just chose to believe that God's power, could, Jesus' power could flow into her powerless condition. But we also have to remember this. We've got to remember this. Remember that beyond a power encounter, Jesus wants a personal encounter with each one of us. I mean, beyond a power encounters are wonderful. I'm praying for more of them here at church. But you know what? Beyond that, he wants a personal encounter. So here's the end of this story. Immediately, verse 29, her bleeding stopped. Uh, well, we just read that one. So uh, the next one, so picking up in verse 30. He, Jesus, turned around in the crowd. So power flowed out of him. This lady's healed. I mean, we could have called that the end of the story. That would have been perfectly fine. She's healed. And Jairus' daughter is dying, so he better keep hoofing it to get there in time. Well, Jesus instead stopped everything. He turned around in the crowd and asked, like, who touched my clothes? Well, the disciples said, you, you see the people crowding against you, uh, and yet you ask, who touched me? Now, from the previous chapters, uh, we, we could understand the disciples are pretty tired and hungry by this point. And now Jesus is traipsing off after this synagogue leader. And they're going, Mama Mia, what's he doing? We need to eat. So they're not only tired and hungry, they're cranky. And Jesus said, who touched me? And they literally turn around and say, uh, you ask who touched you? Read my lips, everyone. But Jesus wasn't going to stop, verse 32. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened, so he keeps looking around. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. She's probably fearful because he was now ritually unclean. And as far as we know, Jesus didn't quarantine. He, he came to fulfill the law. But you know what? She was probably afraid of that. She may be even afraid of her presumption. Like, he healed me, and I didn't even ask his permission. What's he going to think of me? So she's trembling. She falls at his feet and tells him the truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith healed you. Oh, Jesus healed her. But she wouldn't get, give up reaching out in faith. Your faith healed you. And then he said, go in shalom, peace, which is the ultimate wholeness word. He pronounces wholeness over her life. And she not only had a power encounter with Jesus, but she had a personal encounter with Jesus. And sometimes people say to me, well, I grew up in the Bible Belt. I must be a Christian. No, you can grow up in the Bible Belt and, and not know Jesus at all. Some of you even had supernatural. I, I know Christians who have supernatural encounters. with God. God's done a miracle in their life, but they still don't serve him or know him. I grew up in a background with lots of rules. I grew up in a conservative Christian background like some of you did. And there are lots of rules. I mean, lots of rules. And all the emphasis was on keeping the rules and, the mora and being a moral person. But you can keep the rules and be a moral person and still not know Jesus. I mean, I don't go to theaters, you know, don't listen to secular music, don't play cards, you know, don't drink, don't smoke or chew or kiss the girls who do, um, uh, you know, and especially on Sunday, except for going to church twice, don't do anything. I mean, barely even breathe or eat, you know. And I had friends 
who miss Jesus because of that. Because even a moral life can keep you away from a personal encounter with Jesus. You can even have a power encounter with Jesus, but not know Jesus. And so Jesus ends his story in the most wonderful way I can imagine. I remember once he sent his disciples out, gave them authority to cast out demons and heal. They come back, they debrief, they're going on and on, all their spiritual war stories. And Jesus said, don't be excited that people can be delivered and people can be healed. Just be glad your name is written in heaven. Just be glad you belong to me. And Jesus won't leave the scene. It's not enough just for this woman to have had a power encounter. He won't leave the scene until he has a personal encounter with her. With her. So that's the most important thing of all, that you know him. Whether you have a power encounter on your schedule or not, that you know him. He walks with us and talks with us. You, we, we walk in his spirit every day. We are never alone. He's always attentive to our grief. Every place we're powerless. I mean, it's just drawing his insides out. And he knows how to respond to that and when to do it. Whether it's now or 12 years from now. Or in my case, with another answered prayer 18 years from now. But I want to tell you, he is there. He has the victim in mind, the psalmist wrote. He sees trouble and grief. And he is relentlessly and ceaselessly good. So we keep going after healing. We keep believing that Jesus' power can flow into our powerlessness. But we also seek above all else that we know him personally. I'd like you to bow your heads, close your eyes just for a moment. Maybe that last part right there. I mean, you, you need Jesus More than you need a miracle, you need Jesus who will be your closest friend whose presence can fill you. And Lord Jesus, I just pray for every person here. And while I'm praying this, if you need Jesus, just kind of lift your hand for a moment while I'm praying this prayer. Lord Jesus, we just need you. I need you. I'm desperate. My life's empty without you. Lord, I'm facing things I do feel powerless against. But Lord, would you give me a personal encounter with you? I want to know you. I want to be filled with your spirit. Thank you for forgiving my sin on the cross, for, for taking the penalty away. And so I turn from my sin. I repent of my sin. I, I turn around. I start going towards you instead of away from you. Lord Jesus, with my hand raised, I reach out to you and say, here I am. Here I am, Lord. Thank you for your life. And Lord, I pray for everybody who's kind of desperate. Lord, we... There's been a gap between your goodness and what we seem like we're experiencing right now. But I pray you'll give us a holy desperation and let our weakness actually attract your power in Jesus' name. And we thank you. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a closing song. And I'd like just those of you who are prayer partners, if you come, and uh, we're just going to just continue to make this a sanctuary of God's presence. He's going to do some powerful things in the next few moments. If you need prayer, even if it's the 51st time, if you need prayer, you come. Keep reaching like that lady. Keep straining. It's not easy. Lots of people around. But just keep straining. Keep believing that his power can touch your powerlessness. And if you need to start a relationship with Jesus, the most important thing, if you, if you don't feel, if, if you have any question about whether you really know Jesus or not, you know him or not, I want you to come and we can lead you in prayer as well. Let's sing in faith. Most declared I'm calling, and I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. Come on, let's sing it. I'm calling. I'm calling. The God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. For me, for me. Come on, your voice, God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you now. Oh, how I need you now. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. Yeah. Come on, we call 
out to him to clear it. Well, I'm calling on the God of Mary. His favor rests on us. Whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. Come on, raise our faith today. I'm calling on the God of David. He made a shepherd boy. Shepherd boy, courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. Oh how I need you now. Rock of ages. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing. Your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing. I'm standing on your faithfulness. Amen? You're the same God. You haven't changed. And I'm standing on your faithfulness. It's so wonderful to be in the presence of God with you today. And you're welcome to linger. The worship team is going to continue to lead. Prayer partners are still up here. You're welcome to linger. I do remind you tonight, oh, it's incredibly, these powerful nights of prayer and worship we've been having encourage you to be here this was a national day of prayer this past week and the church in South Korea actually sent 40 prayer teams 
all across America. And one of them has been here in Springfield, praying at the Sons of God headquarters next door in the prayer center, convoy of help. They're at James River this morning, but they're going to be with us at night tonight. And that team is going to be praying over all of us at the end of our service tonight. And the choir will be with us. We're going to have a wonderful worship time. Then don't forget next week, 10 o'clock, right? Not 10.45. A combined so early and, and, and later service combined together. And we'll have refreshments and fellowship in the lobby at 9. One service combined, 10, to celebrate Mother's Day. And you probably get out a little earlier than usual as a result to go, to go make that a great day. God bless you. Love and appreciate you all. Go in Jesus' name.